Seven Foundational Strategies to Investing in Commercial Real Estate. And this kind of came about through a conversation with a friend who's interested in investing in commercial real estate. And he was asking me some really good questions and it, it got me to thinking in terms of like, okay, like how do I distill this down? Like what are the things that worked really well for me? And what are the things that looking back I would have done differently? And so I, uh, I typed it up and uh, actually this is part of a free training that I'll be giving to um, anybody that is kind of on my email list. And I'll talk more about that at the end. So let's get into it. Now, okay, number one, market cycles, buying in a recession. So this is probably one of the things that I, I witnessed most, which is like really buying properties when sellers need to sell. Um, I've never been a fan of having to be in competitive offers. Doesn't mean that you only buy in recessions. Like I've bought all through hot markets, you know, up, down markets, all the rest of it, but I'm always looking for a few things. One, uh, I don't want to compete, which means I'm usually going off market or going direct. Uh, and two is I don't like to be competing against other buyers because that just usually pushes the price up. And um, the person that that wins generally, not always, is the person that's paying more. Although there are some strategies on how to get it even for cheaper. Number two is value add. So I'm always looking for uh, properties where I can add some value, especially when you're raising capital. <clears throat> this was, uh, I remember having a conversation with, uh, with a prospective investor that was going to put a lot of money into one of my deals. And he just asked me point blank, like, what are you doing? Right? Like I could invest in Boardwalk. I could invest in Main Street. I could go to, you know, a whole host of other places to put my money. So why am I giving it to you? And now it's much easier because I'm a developer and so I'm taking raw land and actually building something. So obviously I'm adding, you know, a lot more value than just value add. However, if I was just starting, that would be the, the next biggest thing. Uh, number three is selling. I've made this mistake and I'll get more into it um, in the second part of this video slash podcast. And that is when the market, like as markets ebb and flow, when you get to the top of a market, if a property is not a property you plan to keep for generations or you know wh whatever your strategy is for that specific property. So I'll give you a, a really good example. I bought an apartment building and the strategy was we're gonna add value, raise the rents, and I, I didn't have a clear exit, right? I didn't actually understand that we could do it so quickly. And it was going to be part of a bigger portfolio, but we never actually completed the portfolio. And what ended up happening was we went through the up market, it came down and then it remained low for seven years. Okay. So just having that clarity on, uh, and I'm not making that mistake again, I can tell you that right now, uh, I've got a couple properties that um, I have interested buyers. And because I don't get too emotionally invested in them, if the right number comes through, then we'll sell them. Uh, number four is specialization. This is probably one of the one of the other big mistakes that I made, which was going from you know I I, I was really starting to learn and master multifamily. Then it went into mobile homes, then into retail, then into industrial, and at every stage, you're having to relearn. And it's exciting and it's nice because you're always feeling like you're growing. However to go up against someone that has been in say multifamily for 25 years and you've only been at it for three years you know you might be able to compete but they're just going to have an edge on you and so uh, i would i would certainly stay away from being a generalist and i would be focused on um you know really mastering one asset class next is having capital to take advantage of opportunities and move fast i can tell you pretty much without question, especially especially when you're small, right? So I'm, I'm talking to most, let's call it private investors. Obviously, if you're an institutional investor, it's unlikely you're going to be able to move as quick as someone smaller because there's just multiple people that have to weigh in on, a, on an investing decision. And so that is one of the advantages, if you will. So A, if you have capital and you can make decisions quickly, that's how you compete against some of the players that are more well capitalized. 
Uh, number six is avoiding a single point of failure. And so uh, I'll, I'll, get, I'll tell a, a story here in a, in a second, but essentially what that means is having one tenant um, or let's say you require low interest rates for the deal to work. I mean, you just you want to move away from anything where one thing can actually take you out of the deal. <clears throat> and number seven, com- commercial real estate is all about debt. And so as you can probably see right now, if you're in the market and you're trying to secure debt, it is, I, I would estimate two to three times harder today to get financing than it was uh, two or three years ago. Okay, so that's just a reality that we have to kind of, that <laughs> that we're in. And uh, it's, it's also like if it goes back to having that capital and being able to deploy it and take advantage of opportunities, right? Because if, a debt, if debt is harder, that means anybody that has capital or the, the ability to raise capital is going to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. So those are kind of like the seven things that I look at. Now, if all you do is you invert those seven and you say like, if you avoid those seven that's where I would say 95 per, 95% of the mistakes I've, I've made and seen others make um, would would fall under those. So I'll, I'll give you the examples here because I think these are probably even more relevant and they drive home the points much better because what I just told you might seem like common sense, but then when you hear the inverse, I think it, it'll just have a little more, um, I think it'll be more helpful. Okay, so market cycles, buying at the top of the market, <clears throat> excuse me, when everyone else is buying. I mean, this sounds so obvious. However, I can tell you over the past like three or four years, I was I, like when I was coaching, I don't do that anymore, but when I was coaching and when I was talking to a lot of investors on a frequent basis, I was shocked at how they were competing, how the, the extremely low cap rates, I mean, they were just chasing deals and I was constantly reinforcing the idea of just being patient and finding opportunities not being in a hurry to to acquire something okay and so like you saw it i mean it was just a huge run-up of investors that all wanted to get into commercial multifamily, self-storage whatever it happens to be um, i think that that is starting to dwindle but the smart people are saying you know what this is where the real opportunities are going to come about okay uh, number two, buying properties where there is no value add, right? Like essentially just buying what I call coupon clippers. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I don't, I'm not even going to go <laughs> into anything else on that. Uh, number three is not selling uh, when the property should be sold. Okay, so the multifamily that I shared with you earlier, had I taken advantage uh, back in 2014, I think it was, I would have probably capitalized and made about 500,000, which would have been about a 50 or 60% return in about two years. Um, I didn't, I held it, got my head kicked in for the last eight years on that property and we will take um, a loss. It'll be a small loss, but if you if you factor in how much effort, time, energy, all the rest of it that went into managing that property over the past eight years, um, I mean, the money is one thing, but the but you don't get that time back and that effort that goes into that type of a property. So if I could just reinforce the idea of just having a really clear plan when you buy a property, and if you know that you're going to sell it in two years, don't put 10 year money on it. That would be the other kind of mistake. Uh, number four, being a generalist. So for me, when I started, I was across Canada. I was into the US. I was buying apartments. Like I said, we were buying distressed debt. We bought... Uh, mobile home parks, we bought industrial retail, ground up, um, and it was fun. I wouldn't trade it because it, it gave me a very broad foundation. And now, I, uh, now I'm able to basically say, okay, this is why I'm in this asset class at this time, okay? Uh, however, if you could avoid that, I think that would be, um, that would give you a, a significant advantage. Uh, number five, uh, having no capital or moving slow. <clears throat> I'd say probably the biggest miss that I ever had was on a, on a multifamily property down in the U.S. I made an offer on it. It was about $20 million. There was a gentleman that said he was going to finance and back me on this particular property. He ended up being, I'll just 
say a flake like he 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 essentially just fabricated everything uh he talked a good game and 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 frankly i i bought into it but this is before i was able to i wasn't very established right i was i was good at one thing which was kind of hunting <clears throat> hunting and finding properties i wasn't good at raising money back then and so i ended up having to uh, take that deal and i sold it to another buyer they did uh, extremely well. They probably made 13 to $15 million on that property, as well as that just got them into the game and, and they did extremely well. So I look back at that and say like, what was the mistake? And the mistake was I didn't understand how to raise money and I didn't understand like who to trust. And, um, I don't know if you could like necessarily buy a course, read a book on that. I mean, a lot of that's just going to come from business acumen, uh, reading people, and an experience. Uh, number six is having a single point of failure. So I'll, I'll tell you a quick story on this. We had a retail development where we had one tenant, 1200 square feet. They were not an anchor tenant. I mean, we had the thing buttoned up, but in order to trigger our phase two of the debt, we needed to hit, I think it was 80% uh, leasing. And this one tenant would go from like 77.5 up to 88% or whatever the number was. And our bank at the time, I'm not even going to say who the bank was because it, it was a very, very frustrating experience with me. They're one of the big five. Um, they wouldn't budge. And so we basically had to uh, bend over backwards for this one tenant, 1,200 square feet, ridiculous, the amount of terms, what we gave this in, this individual. I would never do it again. I would never... Uh, put myself in that situation and that's what I call a single point of failure is just having that one tenant that had so much friggin leverage on you that they are able to drive the the terms to a point that really don't make sense as a developer <clears throat> uh, and then number seven is you know uh, right now like I, I mentioned in terms of commercial real estate and where the debt market is. So if, if you can see where, where debt is going and the fact that it's going to be more difficult to finance, especially on commercial properties, on residential, it doesn't seem to be the same, um, the same risks, if you will. However, if you are buying like retail, like office for sure, um, probably less so on industrial, I mean, A, the interest rates are much higher which means you're probably gonna have much lower loan to values, which means you're gonna need more capital, right? So if you have five and seven together, five is having access to capital and seven being the fact that you just know debt is going to be uh, harder to come by. I feel that this is where it starts to move back into a buyer's market, right? So back into number one, a market cycle. So when it's a buyer's market or there's less competition, this is really where I think you're gonna see some smart individuals take advantage and and do well. So um, hopefully that's helpful. Uh, like I said, this has been just kind of really reflecting on what it was that helped me to invest. And I thought I would share it with you. All right, that's it for now. See you next week.